Welcome to The Green Screen. Greenscreen.tv is brought to you by the C Solar Store, the GES Solar Store, the Green Energy Option Solar Store, and the Union of Concerned Scientists, EarthTech, Ridgeview Construction, and the Green Alliance. I'm your host, Bill Rogers, and for the next 13 weeks, we'll be looking at and for solutions, solutions that save. This week on the green screen, it's things close to home, or at least close to my office in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, USA. Welcome back to the green screen, and here today with Bert Cohen. Bert, thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure, Bill. So uh, tell me, um, we, uh, I've been hearing about the uh, Portsmouth Sustainability Fair, yeah, and for years, I I've been there, yeah. Yeah. and... Um, and I've also been hearing about the efforts towards sustainability in Portsmouth and, and have spoken with you about that on various occasions. Over at Ann Bliss's, you were telling me about vacuum tubes and, uh, and the, the sea hot rate. water. That's yeah. right. I mean, so many different, so many different pieces to uh, sustainability, to making sustainability work. So tell me, what is happening in regard to sustainability uh, here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire? Where do we start? Yeah, where do we start? <laughs> we start lots of places. Yeah. If you were to walk around Portsmouth, uh, in fact, let me just start with the Little Green Trail. Great. Uh, Sustainable Portsmouth, as you probably know, is an organization now that has been several years in the making, which is focusing how do we get the big issues of sustainability, the big scale stuff, down to ground? How do we make them operate on the ground? So one of the things that's happening at our sustainability fair this Saturday is we're gonna inaugurate a little green trail. And that means like you've gone to Boston and you've seen the historic trail. The Freedom we're, Trail? Yeah, the Freedom Trail. Well, this is gonna be a trail where you can go around Portsmouth and see things that are starting to bring us closer to a sustainable Portsmouth, which is where we wanna go. For example, the restaurants are very closely clustered. And where do they put their waste, their kitchen waste? That's an issue because they have to get it out. They can't have it in the way of customers. Several years coming, we now have an enclosure right down by the, uh, the little new park down there. Uh, it's a grave, nobody sees it. And inside that, all of the kitchen waste from many restaurants is put in to that container, then picked up and take taken to be composted. Hmm. Now, here's the thing. On the ground, one of the restaurants said they've reduced their stuff going to landfill by 95%. Whoa. And now, if you multiply that, and that's the beginning where we need to go as a community, and I know that our uh, Landfill here in New Hampshire is getting filled up. And here's where individual citizens, once we see it operating, we have three different composting facilities within 30 miles, commercial. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of putting it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so there are many of those little things. Now what's important, I'm gonna hold this picture up because Portsmouth Eco Municipality. Mm -hmm. Now the composting can, is a, leaf in a whole tree, but we need the whole tree to be healthy. And to be an eco-municipality, we've said that if you'll cut to this at some point, uh, there are four conditions that we need to follow to become sustainable. And so what we do with Sustainable Portsmouth is say, here are the big conditions. How do we coordinate each of the little things that needs to happen here in Portsmouth to make us sustainable? Mm -hmm. Another item that is kind of exciting that you might have heard is about zero waste. Uh, if you go to our park, there is a container there that has the tiles that the high school kids, some of the kids, have made talking about sustainability and those zero waste containers do all the recycling and so forth. Now where is this, uh, where's the park you're talking about? Uh, uh, down park? at Prescott Park, there's a huge container mm -hmm. that there's a committee that got started 
That's great. I mean, I, I like. I actually like the idea that you're putting. Um, you're, you're putting recyclable, composted material at the park, right? At the park. <laughs> That's right, because, oh, we can't put it there. Well, it's got to go somewhere. <laughs> okay, so that we have these containers mm -hmm. now, and that's there's been money in the community raised to pay for an artist in residence to go to the school to help the students design plaques that would help promote sustainability. Mm -hmm. We've hooked it in to the city because how do we pick up this stuff yeah. and how do we make the whole system work? So these are individual projects that takes a lot of people, a lot of care and time. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working at it for several years and that committee that started with zero waste, if you go back a few years, there's Piscataqua Sustainable Initiative, which was study circles about how do these natural steps mm -hmm. work Mm -hmm. Out of that group, they said, we want to take these principles and we want to get them to happen. Mm -hmm. So people have been working with that. Where are you in the uh, kind of arc to, I, I think of a, a film project, a video project, you know, there's, uh, there's a very predictable kind of arc as you go through the life of, of anything. Uh, human lives, project lives, uh, lives of the imagination. Um, where are you and where do you see the sustainability movement uh, today? Yeah. I can say I've been working with this for about 18, 20 years. Mm -hmm. In terms of the movement of consciousness, it's kind of been an exponential curve. Mm -hmm. Most people on the planet now know that we have significant things we need to do for our kids and our grandkids. And that's a tremendous plus. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're having this conversation is wonderful. Couldn't have happened 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. At the same time that my perception that there's been an acceleration in consciousness, there's also been an acceleration in what's happening on the planet that's not going where we want it to go. Mm -hmm. So we have people like Lester Brown, who's mm -hmm. keeping a thermometer on the planet of how healthy or unhealthy we are. And he's saying in his latest book, Earth on the edge or something like that. We need to make a dramatic shift and it has to be a mobilization. So where I get caught is what we can do as individuals is we can recycle our trash, mm -hmm. we can compost, we can save energy. And at the same time, we need to be aware of the larger system and where each of us has a passion and a talent. Can we put that into leveraging for the larger mobilization. And can you uh, relate that larger mobilization maybe to the uh, the, the fair that's happening uh, sure. this this weekend, uh, yesterday as yes. we broadcast this? <laughs> well, let me, let me put this out. I showed you the picture of the eco-municipality, all right? So we've gotten the, over several years to get into our master plan that we would follow these four systems conditions. Mm -hmm. And so, Here's an interesting chart, pie chart. If the city did everything that it should around CO2 emissions, mm -hmm. it would be 2% of the pie of what's happening in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So right now, what I'm excited about your program and more public awareness is that now, if we can get this other 98%, to start working with energy challenges and all the things that you do. Mm -hmm. That's where we are when you say, where are we now? We're at trying to get to the best of our ability on the ground changes in individual lives. And that's hard work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's exciting and it feels good when you have people who you can work with to do it. And that's what uh, the other part, I'm gonna hold up our other logo here, Sustainable Portsmouth. This is a group of folks now who meet every month, second Wednesday of the month, from 7 to 9 in the high school. Read sustainableportsmouth.org. Right. And this is now on the ground, committed people. This little green trail came out of this. Mm -hmm. And there are the zero waste mm -hmm. folks. There's people working on traffic and bike paths and all of the things that individuals can do and working with others to do it is very encouraging.
card, our membership in the Green Alliance, it allows us to buy green, buy local, and save lots of money. My mom likes the discount, and I like the cake. This store is like the old-time hardware store. Come check it out. When I was a kid, my dad took me through this great place where you could find just about any little gadget to do just about anything. These glass tubes are called heat pipes. Sun comes out, starts making steam, things get hot, showers get warm. What we're doing is we're bringing solar to Main Street. So are we on Main Street here? Well, this isn't exactly Main Street. We're on Route 108 north of the Weeks Crossing. In Dover, just, it's a great place where you can come and learn about how you can save energy by using the sun. Now it's time for Ask the Scientist, brought to you by the Union of Concerned Scientists. You know, there, there's, no, there, there's no silver bullet. There's no one-size-fits-all uh, solution. There is, as, uh, as the environmentalist Bill McKibben likes to say, a lot of silver buckshot. There are a lot of different options that we can take, and it's going to be a portfolio of smart solutions, including efficiency, uh, where we can gain lots of, uh, lots of ground by re reducing the need for uh, uh, new energy sources, uh, to expansion of low carbon uh, forms of renewable energy, including wind and solar, uh, the appropriate use of, of nuclear power, uh, carefully safeguarded to make sure we're not expanding it at the expense of our security uh, and at a cost that we can afford. The decisions that individuals are making uh, to buy uh, cars that, uh, that get higher fuel economy, whether it be a, uh, a, a hybrid or now we have available increasingly electric vehicles for people to choose from, to buy um, compact fluorescent bulbs and replace uh, the, the standard bulbs that people have been used. All of these individual choices, as well as the policy choices, are the, are the front end of the trajectory that we need to be on. None of them by themselves none of them by themselves at a policy level or at an individual level add up to the scale of reductions that we, we, we clearly need from the scientific perspective to, uh, to tackle and confront the challenge of climate change. But they're all smart choices. They're all choices that make sense uh, economically uh, and environmentally. And they're choices which, which are so much now part of our lives that they're not, they're not debated. In my view, what we need most is a greater conversation. And here with Kim McGlinchey, and uh, who um, is at Portsmouth High School and in the science program there. Yes. And so you, you've got an eco club, as I understand. And uh, so, what is the, uh, the the Portsmouth Eco Club? What do you guys do over there? Um, great. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. Oh, here sure. It's great. Glad, glad you could and, come in. And um, me and another teacher. Um, Miss Barrett, D. Barrett, mm -hmm. she's a Portsmouth resident, uh, started the Eco Club, oh, I guess around 2005. And um, in the Eco Club, we have about 20 to 40 students, uh, depending on the day, how many come to our meeting. And we work collaboratively on uh, ecological issues. So uh, currently, we have conducted a survey of the whole school, trying to get everyone engaged, and that happened the first year. Mm -hmm. And then we picked the topics that students most wanted to work on. So by collaboratively, do you mean the students get as much as say as the advisors and, and teachers? Absolutely. And uh, the whole community. The survey was given on SurveyMonkey. It was given throughout the district and the town, um, as well as in the school. And we wanted to know uh, how much the students or people knew about sustainability. And we also wanted to know what issues were most important to them that they thought we could easily um, not really fix, but start to make better. Mm -hmm. And so um, after we did the survey, we published it, and um, we came up with energy efficiency was the number one thing that we thought we could work on. Mm. Um, and then the second topic um, had to do with local issues such as the um, Great Bay and nitrogen loads and things like that. How, how do you entice students to get involved in the Eco Club? Do you have to sort of wrestle them in or? Um... Not at all. And actually the survey served as a really good tool for uh, 
enticing people into the issue. Mm -hmm. And um, more than just finding out data from the survey, we, we truly were able to engage people. Um, if they thought that they had a say in what happened, um, we found that that was one way to keep them there, uh, keeping different committees, um, always having people make their own suggestions. It's very small things that everyone could get involved with keeps them in. So um, for energy efficiency, we made little placards that go over the light switches. And in the high school, you have options of turning two fluorescent lights on or just one. And each plaque um, is laminated and it goes over the light switch. And in many different ways, it says, use one please it says it in spanish in english it says it in um, very funny things um, study in the dark or your teacher looks better in the dark or just really silly things the kids all made and then we installed them um, and one great thing that came out of that is portsmouth high school just received a 2010 an energy star plaque um, which we're going to put up and we were recognized as part of the reason that we got the Energy Star plaque. Mm -hmm. We're not the whole reason, but we were part of the reason. So I think keeping kids involved is um, it's pretty easy when you give them real hands-on things to do and they can see their, you know, just something as simple as turn only half of them all and they can see that everyone's doing it. There's no better voice than that, really. Well, I, I can, uh, you know, I, uh, as you know, I've been helping out over at Portsmouth High School uh, in the media department as of a few days ago and um, the uh, there's a, a lot of computers in the beauty department and a Absolutely. lot of them have fans that are on all the time that are and so there, I think there's something malfunctioning with the computers and as in many of those things well we don't know how to turn them off we've got to everything's got to be done properly you don't want to hurt the servers and right. you, know, you got you got to find those things out and find out how to do something simple like being able to turn off uh, servers that aren't actually needed. And just making the, the conscious effort, the, the little sign sitting right there, and it just it just makes sense. We don't need both those lights on really ever, not even in December when the light's very low. You mentioned um, energy efficiency and uh, the Great Bay uh, estuary as, as two of your focuses. How, how has the Great Bay uh, come into the Ecology Club? Well, the, the Great Bay um, just seemed like an issue that kids were passionate about. Um, they've grown up learning that it's a wonderful resource. Um, they recognize through our ecology curriculum that um, the square footage of um, watershed is really large and very overpopulated. And they know that they want to preserve this pristine body um, or what used to be a pristine body, which is not anymore. And um, they learn ways of um, filtering the water and different things through the curriculum, testing for nitrogen. Well, they pretty much all come to the Eco Club after passing that class. They um, have been through it or are currently in it. And so um, one of the things that we did was um, we wanted to create publicity about the health of the Bay, and we worked with the Seco Science Center and um, the media studio, um, Portsmouth High School Media Department, and we made a movie um, about nitrogen loads in the Bay and how that damages the eelgrass community. And um, we involve some local fishermen. Let's, uh, let's show a clip. Oh, wonderful. From you the, have that. Uh, yeah, actually, let's not show a clip. Let's, uh, let's show the whole thing. OK, great, great. <laughs> so. There's some local fishermen on there who really care about the bay as well. And like I said, people are very passionate about it. You have kids from Newington, Greenland, Portsmouth. Um, areas that are just used to knowing that that's a great place to be and when they hear that it's in danger um, of eutrophication or um, nitrogen pollution then they really want to make a difference. So let's take a look at the clip. Eelgrass becomes scarce, we lose several important functions of eelgrass beds and they stop cleansing the water. We lose the ability of eelgrass to, to re-aerate the water, provide oxygen for the system, and we lose the ability of eelgrass to provide a special habitat for all the fish and wildlife that live in the estuary. 
the nutrients coming into the Great Bay Estuary, which is a lot of it now, affects the uh, eelgrass because they can't the, uh, stop the light from getting down, which the eelgrass needs to survive. So now the more uh, nutrients we get in the water, you know, the less light that the eelgrass is going to have. So we've lost a lot of it down here, you know, which, you know, uh, the wastewater treatment plants, the uh, a lot of the fertilizers, I mean, back, you know, 25 years ago, there were just a few camps along here. Now you've got these mansions with, you know, four acres of mowed lawn right down to the water, you know, so they fertilize it and it's nice and green, but that goes in a great bay, so, you know, maybe they're better off if they just paved it and just painted it green, you know, it'd be better for the bay. What people have done and what people can do to reduce declines in eelgrass is uh, two, primarily twofold. What we've done is we've developed the land in our watersheds and we've changed the way that sediments and nutrients are delivered to the, wa to the water, to the bay. And so now nutrients are delivered to the bay much more quickly. So that's one thing we have to think about is how do we keep the nitrogen from getting in the bay from our land activities. The other thing we, we're doing is we're taking a lot of water out of our rivers for drinking water and, and watering our lawns and all those activities that we kind of just take for granted when we turn on the tap at home. When we take water out of the, these rivers and, and wells in the watershed, that means there's less water to flow down the rivers. stem where it grows and then here are the leaves and if you go in all the way in you'll find the youngest leaf which is always kind of fun. Here is the youngest leaf. And one of the things that eelgrass needs is pulses of fresh water uh, and pulses of fresh water allow it to uh, arrest a disease that eelgrass has, all eelgrass has and, uh, and to flourish throughout the rest of the year. Well Eelgrass is interesting too, special, because it gets a disease, and it's a, a disease with a slime mold. Uh, there's many types of slime mold in nature, but there's only one, apparently, one species that actually attacks living tissue, and uh, it attacks uh, eelgrass, and it causes these black areas on the leaf blade. It's called the eelgrass wasting disease. One of the things we learned at the Jackson Estuarine Lab is that the eelgrass leaves need to touch for the disease to spread. And Dr. Fred Short and myself have worked on and outlined the, the way waste and disease spreads from plant to plant. Then you've got the wastewater treatment plants that, like in Dover here, I mean, uh, everything's on city sewer now, it's in Portsmouth and Exeter and all along here. And all that goes into the bay. It's clean, but it's fresh water. Back on the green screen here with uh, Jerry Monkman and uh, heard about Jerry through the Whaleback Film Festivals because you've got a film uh, that's uh, premiering. Is that's it right. a premiere or is this uh, um, not the premiere? But it's a, the first festival appearance. We'll first put festival. it that way. Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting. It's actually my first film. Um, 
And yeah, they chose it to open the festival on Friday night. Well, so it, I'm excited. A, I, I, I uh, had an opportunity to see it, and it's a beautiful film. Just uh, wonderful characters and, and the, the setting, you know, and the, uh, the sense of that solitude of, you know, of, of being with your cows, of being in yeah. that place. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. How was it? Uh, how was it doing that? And how did you get access to that? Uh, that, that those farmers. Sure. Um, yeah, it's actually interesting. I I've, was meeting with a long-term client, the Wildlands Trust of southeastern Massachusetts. They're a land trust down down south of Boston, and uh, we were talking about a uh, audio interview that they had put on their website with some still photography, and and we started then talking about this farm project they were working on, and I thought it'd be really interesting to um, actually interview the farmer and, and do this as a video project, um, which I thought would look more compelling and more interesting than just uh, the audio. Because um, mm -hmm. this guy, when you show the clip, people will see this guy has the look of the salt of the earth, rugged New England farmer, and, and to really show him um, in his element was something I was excited to do. Great, and a good setup. So let's take a look at that clip. Great, thanks. Thanks for a very enjoyable living, that's all. Yeah. We, we related to the Howards. They were one of the first landowners in West Bridgewater back in 1643. They came, you know, came right from, straight from England. And this land here, some of this land here has been in the Howard family ever, ever since then. My, my grandmother was a Howard on my father's side. I, I, it was something like, I don't know, 13 or 14 generations, something like that. My, my father started it in 1942, and I've been here ever since. My brother's been, he's been here almost that long, but not quite. He, he had a stint in the Army, and he, he worked, at a, worked off the farm for a little while, but he eventually came back to the farm. But that's the, that's the problem today. There isn't many kids coming back to the farm anymore. They're all leaving, and a lot of the family farms are all around this area are, are disappearing. This, this area right around here has is, is stayed more or less the same just for the fact that we're, we're still here and we haven't sold any of the land. When I was in high school, there was something like 20 dairy farms right in this town of West Bridgewater. Now there's only three left. The, the rest of them have just gone out of business. Either the land's been developed or a lot of the land that we use are, 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 are from farms that you know have, have, been, have gone out of business. They, they don't want the land developed, but they they want to use, and that's what we do. We use the land, yeah. And I, you know, I, I just, I love the land. I, I would hate to see it developed. That'd be the last thing. If I, if this farm was to get sold, I, I'd have to. I think I'd have to move away and go somewhere else, and nobody will take it. It isn't so much the money or anything like that. It's just I just want to see the land stay open and stay the way it is. Well, it, it, it looks like there's not going to be anybody right off now to take the farm over when my brother and I get done. My, my children aren't interested in it and his children aren't either. And that's, that's the trouble today with a lot of the farms. It just the younger generation doesn't, just doesn't want to put in the hours. Or, and this, you know, it, we, we're not really getting rich at it, but it's something that you like, you love to do. You just have to like to do it more than anything. So that'll do us for this week on The Green Screen. Join us next week for more solutions.